was now United States public enemy number one. No time, money, or labor will be spared toward bringing about the apprehension of the individuals responsible for this cowardly and despicable act. They must be exterminated. And to this end, we are dedicating ourselves. J. Edgar Hoover, 1933. The rise of Charlie Floyd and the rise of J. Edgar Hoover came together. Floyd had a couple of 45s, he had a Thompson submachine gun, he had a fast car. But he had a little else, except a big reputation, one built constantly by the newspapers, the popular press, the pulp magazines. By making Floyd into public enemy number one, Hoover made himself and his organization important by bringing him down. J. Edgar Hoover owed a lot to Charlie Floyd. With their wanted posters plastered coast to coast, Charlie and his partner, Adam Ricchetti, were running for their lives. By now, Charlie had reunited with his girlfriend, Beulah, along with her sister, Rose, who took a liking to Adam. Charlie and Adam Ricchetti and the girls, Beulah and Rose, now left with parts unknown. Eventually, they arrived in Buffalo, New York, there to spend almost a year in hiding. Once in Buffalo, they spent most of their time in an upstairs apartment, getting cabin fever after not too many months. After one year of isolation, the foursome couldn't take it any longer. They decided to come home to Charlie's beloved Oklahoma Hills. Sometime during the night of October 19th and 20th, 1934, they were passing uh, between East Liverpool and Wellsville, Ohio, which are two little river towns uh, right on the Ohio River, uh, about four or five miles apart, and they had an accident. Charlie and Adam Rochetti decided that they would wait on a hillside uh, just outside of Wellsville, Ohio, and they sent the women with the car, which was apparently still drivable, into East Liverpool to, to get repairs made. Adam and Charlie grabbed a couple blankets and their weapons and went up on the hillside there uh, to wait for them. And they were, uh, they stuck out uh, as strangers. And some of the locals there spotted them. And by and by, uh, the local uh, policemen came out to check it out. Uh, a little bit of a gun scrape ensued. Adam was taken prisoner. There were a lot of shots fired. Uh, Phantom Terror managed to escape. With local police now aware who Adam Ricchetti was, federal officers were called in. The hunt was on for pretty boy Floyd. Floyd roamed the woods of, of Columbiana County for 48 hours. Finally, on the afternoon of, of October 22nd, he came out of the woods uh, about 15 or 16 miles from the spot where he had jumped out of the car and approached the home of a, a widow named Ellen Conkle and asked her for a meal. He explained to her that he had been out squirrel hunting. Well, she knew he wasn't any squirrel hunter, not in that dirty blue suit and a necktie. And she fed him anyway. People didn't turn people away from the door back then. Why she didn't suspect that this was the guy on the front page of the newspaper, I have no idea. But in October 1934, the last thing on anybody's mind in, in this part of the Ohio Valley was, you know, the sudden appearance of public enemy number one. She prepared him a fairly respectable meal. Uh, he ate the meal, was very pleased with it, termed it as fit for a king, and gave her a dollar for it when he concluded, which is about four or five times what a meal like that would have cost back then. He looked about, he saw that there was a car outside, asked whose it was, and if he couldn't get a ride. The car belonged to Mrs. Conkle's brother, Stuart Dyke, who agreed to, to drive Floyd. But as they were pulling out of the farm, their exit was blocked by the law. 
Melvin Purvis, Hoover's right-hand man, and local law enforcement agents, including a World War I sharpshooter, Chester Smith, were going from farm to farm, searching for Charlie. They found their man. Floyd immediately leapt from the car, but there was nowhere to go, just open fields, and he began to sprint across an open cornfield. Only the stubs, the stalks, stood up. He was completely exposed. I raised my 3220 Winchester rifle. I didn't want to kill him, so I shot, hit him in the right forearm. I shot the second time, hit him in the right shoulder. And here's where you get the two versions of the story. You get the Ohio version, you get the FBI. The FBI says they talked to him and Purvis interrogated him and he spat at him and cursed him and he died. But the Ohio people, the truth is Chester Smith told it that finally when he got what he wanted out of Floyd, that's when Purvis said, do him in and they killed him. They shot him point blank in that field and that young man died 30 years old forever right there on that spot. The reason why there's a conflicting in Purvis's story and mine, he said that uh, his information was not to be revealed to the public, and they wanted to make it announce that I had killed him. When I was in school, they'd say, there goes Chester Smith's daughter. He killed pretty boy Floyd, you know, and they'd say, is that true? And I'd say, well, no, he shot him. If my father had wanted to kill the man, it would have been easy to kill him. He could hit him in a very vital spot, seeing that he was a sharpshooter. He did not intend to kill. He intended to bring him down. Melvin Purvis ordered put into his back when he was laying there in the cornfield. And that's execution. Although he was a killer and he was a bank robber, that day he didn't fire a shot on Mrs. Conkle's farm. Nobody was shot on Mr. Conkle's farm, but my uncle, Charlie. I walked the last 100 yards that Charlie walked, and he could have been a world-class sprinter, and he couldn't have made it to the top. But he wasn't going back to jail. He wasn't going to be caged up like a lion the rest of his life. And he paid for it. Regardless of how Charlie died, he was just as popular dead as he was alive. At the funeral home, it was uh, kind of a, a, a mild form of, of complete chaos. And uh, they brought the body there and uh, put it on the, the table. And, and while it was on the table, everybody that had any connection with the East Liverpool Police Department managed to get their picture taken with the body. They're fingerprinting the corpse. And everybody wanted to see public enemy number one. Crowds that are variously estimated at anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 people just absolutely descended on the Sturgis funeral home. Uh, and, and eventually, Floyd was displayed for the public on a, a little, uh, like a day bed, a crushed velvet uh, cover up to his neck. When Charlie's body was finally shipped back home, his funeral was an event. To this day, it is the largest funeral in Oklahoma's history. I was 14 years old when this was happening, and it was awesome. And it was just solid line of cars, bumper to bumper, dust and dirt blowing and whatever. People crowding in, trying to, it was pathetic the way people had acted trying to get in the front row seat. Some say as many as 40,000, maybe even more people showed up. Every flower shop at Fort Smith and Muskogee and all throughout that part of the country was wiped out. They bought every bloom and blade and sent it to Aikens. They sent it over to Pretty Boy, to Charlie. While the public clamored for one last glimpse of Charlie Floyd, his family somberly reflected on their memories of him alive. He had come to our house one night, and the door opened. There was a mirror hanging on the wall right there. 
and I could see him in that mirror. He was smiling, you know. He always had a nice smile. And that's the last 